Hello. Hello, everyone. I have a big audience out all over the US and uh, this group of four of us here today. We are in different places along the eastern seaboard, New York, Boston. So welcome. We do have one in the west. And so welcome everyone east and west. I hope everyone is dealing with the weather all right and has decent weather where you are. My name is Chris Robinson. And I work at the University of Boston. Be you, go be you. I think there's some be you people in the house. In my role today is to connect people from different places, other universities, and we're gonna talk about communication access and barriers and how we can break down some of those barriers. And the focus today is on the arts. My role today is to connect people from different places. We're gonna introduce our other presenters and our panelists. And we're going to talk about. We're going to have a great discussion. So first, I want to talk with the two people on the lower panel here, in our in our panel. Is on the arts. My role today. It's Annie Wigand and Kala. We're going to describe who they are and and discuss how, what their role is here today. Great discussion. So first. Hello, I'm Annie, and I have a lot of different hats in the theater world, but my primary role is I'm a professional lighting designer, and freelance. I'm a freelance designer. I've been working in the field for over 10 years. I've been living here in New York, and another hat that I wear, I'm assistant professor at Gallaudet. Professor at Gallaudet. Thank you. I started uh, full-time there um, last spring. And I also, um, currently I'm currently doing commuting for that role. And let's see um, which, which, which uh, role I'm discussing next, okay. Another hat that I wear, being the assistant manager of the theater uh, for the deaf, New York Deaf Theater. I'm a teaching artist as well. With the roundabout. With the roundabout theater company. Space. Space. Theater, theater collective as well. And I've been a professional designer for places around the country as well. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And now, Kala. Hi, everybody. I'm Kala Granger. I've been a theater artist and have had a lot of different roles over the years. I've been a stage manager, an actor. I've worked in ed ed administration. I work with Access a lot in different theater companies. Right now, I'm at Gallaudet University. I'm an administrative assistant for the Multicultural Affairs Office, and I've worked with a lot of theaters in that area. I'm really happy to be here. I'm uh, DC based right now, but I'm from, I'm, I'm originally from Maine. Wonderful, thank you. A lot of New England folks, all right. And Joey, you mind introducing yourself and your sign name and all that. Hi everyone, my name is Joey Caverly. This is my sign name. My pronoun is he and him and his. Currently, I'm in the DC area and I wear a lot of hats as well. I'm primarily an actor. I'm also a director and a DAZZLE, which stands for Director of Artistic Sign Language. I teach workshops, I'm a teaching artist. And I also work as a carpenter 
for various theater companies in the region. Very handy man. Master of all trades. Great, wonderful. So to set up how this discussion will proceed, um, I wanna first uh, give our hearing audience a little bit of, of a taste of uh, what this communication will look like, how this discussion will go. Uh, we have different interpreters will be will speaking while the deaf panelists and myself will be signing. Each person who is signing on screen here, Joey, Annie, Kala, will identify themselves before they go and sign. So that when we're having our discussion, the interpreters will be able to announce who's talking. So the hearing people who don't rely on their eyes so much can kind of make that mental connection as to who's talking and what they're talking about. When they see the hands moving, then they finally kind of catch up to what's going on. But it's helpful to have the introduction of yourselves when you're talking. Um, as we go, we'll get a little more uh, used to how this flow works. Um, it's important to preserve the communication, make sure our points are clear. Um, maybe we have to physically move. Maybe we, uh, there's something that's not clear. If there's some kind of issue uh, or a visual distraction, um, you all have permission to kind of remind me that we have a problem and we can resolve that. Um, this is what we're valuing here in this group. We want to make sure communication is clear. We'll start this discussion now. Um, I'm going to start with a short story to kind of give uh, a framing for this uh, discussion, talking about affirming um, instead of uh, being negative about changing behaviors. So talking about what's beneficial, how we can improve. And instead of how we can, we need to avoid things, let's look at what we should be doing. So um, I'm going to introduce my friend here, who is a, a Pez dispenser, namely a classic uh, 50s, 60s Riddler Pez dispenser. Um, for many years, people would see uh, children and adults walking around with these little Pez dispensers became popular. And the, the concept behind it was um, from many, many years ago, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, uh, was looking for a way to help people to break their addiction with cigarettes. Um, because, you know, people were often stigmatized. They wanted to get away from stigmatizing the person who smoked and look for the behavior that, that caused them to feel addicted and, and perpetuated the addiction. And those habits that they'd have related to their smoking. So they, you know, if you think of it like a lighter when you're smoking, that's a very common behavior that's associated with smoking. So they tried to do something to replace this negative behavior of using a lighter all the time. Instead, when you open it, you get candy out of it. Um, it used to be called peppermints, and it became, I used the word, the German word for peppermints, and it became abbreviated to Pez. But, and that's what's happened to replace this, the smoking habit. So it was, it was brought into the picture to help reduce smoking. That same concept of using something positive to replace something negative instead of trying to avoid a negative behavior um, applies to today and what we're talking about. Instead of focusing on those negative behaviors and trying to avoid them and being afraid of them, we often cause that problem to, to worsen. Instead, we should be focusing on how, how we can focus on how we can improve our behaviors and do new things and better things. So today is a, an opportunity to get a nice candy. Um, we're looking at how to affirm and, and move in the right direction. So. Annie, Kala, Joey, I think we're ready to get moving on this. Let's go. All right. So those of you who have seen these uh, discussions for the production and stage managers, the PSM, I want to thank the PSM for helping set this up before we get started. And I want to thank for the audience. And I want to thank HowlRound 
uh, who's hosted. Um, they, they've done a great job setting this up and, and, and creating a great space for our audience to see it. I want to say thank, the, thank you to the VRS company, Sorensen. Uh, thank them for supporting this. And I want to also thank my favorite place of business, <laughs> my favorite place to work, Boston University. I also want to thank uh, the interpreters who you can't see, but you can hear them uh, doing all the work behind the scenes. So the first thing I want to put out for our discussion is uh, in theaters. Um, theaters that are primarily uh, staffed by hearing people. That, that concept of audience, the sound-based uh, audience, you think about an audience being odd, being focused on the sound. How does that, that theater companies that are focused on the hearing audiences how, and, and have primarily staffed hearing people, how can they better support deaf artists, deaf designers? What is the first thing you can think of that should be improved to make it more friendly for deaf and hard of hearing folks? So I think Annie looks like she has something ready. So I'll let her take the wheel. So Annie's asking, what's the first thing, thing that should be done? She says yes. I'm having technical difficulties with the audio. Isaiah can help out with the audio for this. I can interpret this question if that's helpful. So Annie's going to start her question over again while we get the audio cleaned up. It's a great example of a communication challenge we're talking about here today. Sometimes you have to be patient. That's one thing that's helpful is being patient and go with the flow. But my initial statement was that theater companies, the best thing they can do is be open-minded. The big focus on diversity right now it's it's a great thing, and there's so many different uh, pieces of this intersection. Now we're talking about people of color and and other different groups that we're we have to to consider. And I think being open minded is the greatest way to to make sure we're not overlooking those groups. Kala, did you have something to add? Yep, this is Kala speaking. I also think everybody is different. And not all people who identify as deaf have the same needs. So it's really important that the theater company ask that specific deaf person, what are their needs? Great, Joey? This is Joey. For me, uh, I'll try to keep this uh, under two minutes and not go on and on. The first thing is that a theater company needs to recognize what the deaf community looks like in their immediate region. Deaf communities in different cities look differently. Some cities don't have a very robust deaf community. So you have to look in, into what your audience needs and also what they want. If you have a robust deaf population in your area, <coughs> then it's probably a good idea to look around for deaf actors, technicians, designers. A theater company should understand that the deaf community has historically been faced with over 200 years of neglect, oppression, uh, systematically and systemically. Our ability to gain access to higher education has allowed us to enter into the field of the arts. But I'd like to say that the number of deaf artists has increased significantly 
in the last year. For example, on Broadway, you'll notice now more deaf actors are on the main stages with more frequency. Compared to 20 years ago, it was almost unheard of. Yes. Beautiful. And so recognition alone is powerful enough. So we already have, you know, the fact that deaf people are here. We are have we already have deaf people working in the field. And we can't ignore them. We can't push them aside. We can't believe they're not here because they are they're in our space. They share a space with us in the theater. But what we asked was, you know, what was in that production process looking back. One thing I want to ask is theater production companies, what, what do they need to do? The first thing we talked about related to production process. So let's talk about that. What rehearsals, the, that rehearsal process, we'll get to that. Um, other aspects of it, the hiring and all that, but let's talk about specifically this, this production process. What's your deaf perspective on that? What, what things are we overlooking in the hearing space? Joey? Yeah, this is Joey. I'll throw in my two cents. I'll use this moment to speak from the perspective of a director. And you're yourself a director, isn't that yes. true? Yes. Yes, I am a director. So let's talk about the pre-production period before rehearsals begin. When I'm on the job, I ask the theater company to keep an open mind. There may be some accessibility requests that a theater company might be uh, hesitant or apprehensive to providing. For example, the number of interpreters needed or the number of deaf actors that are going to be involved in a production. It might seem daunting. They might feel intimidated. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I have faced numerous times in the past where a theater company is sort of collectively is like, oh no, we have to work with deaf actors uh, and they want to avoid some of the challenges as much as they can. There is a, uh, for lack of a better word, a natural ignorance that works itself out. I've been involved in this business for a long time So I know how this process goes. It takes time to grow comfortable. Accessibility is a requirement. There are needs that need to be met and they do end up working themselves out. I'd like to clarify with you, Joy. It seems like all of you have mentioned keeping this open mind. What does that look like to you? I think I don't think a lot of people would say, "Oh, I'm a, you know, I'm scared of, you know, people in the arts are are really friendly." I don't think they'd be like really actually afraid of deaf people. So, what behaviors are we actually seeing with this hesitation, with this, uh, what kind of open-mindedness is missing? Because maybe they have, you know, concerns about budgets. Maybe it's related to availability of space, um, hotel accommodations. What other things? haven't you mentioned or haven't been mentioned what, what is this fear how does it manifest this is joey i'll speak briefly on that so i worked on a show uh romeo and juliet a production of romeo and juliet at a community college near baltimore i was involved with that production and initially the people who were uh, higher up at the school, they thought, oh, they could have deaf and hearing actors on stage together. However, many of the people that thought of this grand idea had no idea about deaf culture. It was perhaps the first time that they had encountered a deaf person. So there was some fear of the unknown. 
And that was apparent from the first day of rehearsal. Oh, what it happened? Rehearsal and or pre-production meetings. Basically the first few times that I sat down at the table with them and they were, I was sharing my interpretation of um, this version of Romeo and Juliet. Okay. It's a normal feeling to have apprehensiveness about the unknown. And at the same time being really excited and enlivened by this new idea. These people in the administration had never worked with deaf artists before, and it's normal for this fear to arise. If they were aware of deaf culture, if they had already met a deaf person before, then that fear would not persist and it would just turn into a level of comfort. Thank you. I'll get back to you, Joey, about the, the rest of what you wanted to say. Uh, when, if uh, the folks in New York had something to talk about their frustrations in this production process. I think this is Annie speaking. I think it's important to remember that deaf actors are artists. You know, we're we're all equal. And if, to the uh, hearing the hearing um, um, artists, and we have the just different experiences. But we, you know, I mean, we might have even higher level of motivation <laughs> because of our experiences. But we have to have theater companies remember that that um, everything will work out, and we're equals in this equation. And what uh, Kala said, you know, the question of uh, talking about fear, you know, we're here to help uh, answer questions and to help resolve uh, issues that do arise. And I've learned a lot over the years um, about compromise and working together um, in this process and really collaborating. And I wanna keep, uh, you know, lighting shows, of course, so I have to be able to collaborate with people and go through these and explain what I need and different ideas I have and to, uh, work through issues. Yeah, you know, you have to collaborate in, in theater. It is a collaborative process, so it's just another aspect of it, working with deaf artists. Oh, I agree. Kala, do you have something to add? Yeah, this is Kala. I'll add briefly that it's really important to consider including deaf people at all levels of the production mm. process, from like the scenic plan, or I'm sorry, the season plan, and uh, the casting, casting decisions and don't be afraid to, uh, to have interpreters for the casting process because you'll you'll get in this point where you cast a deaf person and then oh my god what do I do after I cast a deaf person so it's important to in 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 involve all those things earlier in the process because it's really hard to predict what that deaf person is going to need and think and think ahead basically so if you have a show says a show say that you want to incorporate deaf and hearing actors on stage or deaf designers, it's really important that that whole team have an open mind and be able to adapt from the beginnings of the process and not add the access on later. Beautiful. Um, so let's talk about, Colin, you had mentioned about all these levels, uh, including deaf people on every level. And you had mentioned about a play you've been involved in or directed, uh, the Romeo and Juliet, Joey, you'd mentioned that. Um, and it felt like, you know, talking about that first scene and, and getting introduced and uh, right at the beginning of Romeo and Juliet, there's a fight that happens, but so what should hearing stage managers and producers think about and what do you designers think about relate in relation to and staging? I mean, that process you know, doesn't happen to opening night. There's so much that happens ahead of time and how you stage a play. So you had, had your own interpretation of it. So what, what did that look like? This is Joey. Okay, staging. Of course, every director has a, a different way to approach the process. Some prefer to sit back in the house and yell out uh, directions to the actors that are just moving around on stage. Uh, some directors have a more intimate approach. They might go on the stage themselves, talk to the actors. Deaf artists, deaf actors, obviously, they can't hear. So if you want to stop them in the middle of some scene work, let's say, 
it might be beneficial to go up onto the stage and get their attention that way or flash lights. Other hearing actors can hear uh, when hold is called. Everyone calls hold. Yes, okay. everyone says the sign hold, Annie says. From my experiences in deaf productions, the communication needs are higher and there's a natural level of clarification uh, in the teamwork. Okay. Maybe a stage manager might call hold in a hearing production, but in a deaf production, when a stage manager calls hold, everyone on stage repeats that sign, hold, 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 until everyone is actually at a hold and then they continue on with their work. Okay, so it seems like, you know, beforehand you have a discussion and agree about, you know, what communication, you know, terms need to be kind of a, a shifted these, what we typically would do. So there's some sticky issues, um, for example, for directors, you know, hopping up on stage uh, with the actors. Some people feel a little bit off put by that you know, the director's kind of overstepping their bounds, literally, but um, so there's, you know, different approaches to that, but the, so there's a, a different approach with deaf directors and where it's more common and acceptable to be on stage with the actors. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Well, I certainly cannot speak for other deaf directors. I will speak for myself that it feels more natural to actually go onto the stage uh, with the actors to gain their attention. Okay. Other deaf directors uh, might prefer to take a back seat uh, and give directions from afar. Beautiful. Now I'll, I'll talk to Annie about what, what she thinks it's about, but I was thinking about envisioning that the production managers, how they think um, if the director is deaf, or hearing, um, what do we think about like physically for the stage and the audience? Will we have steps up to the stage so that they can access the stage more easily? Because some stages really don't think of it and don't have that set up. So you can have options for the directors if they wanted to get up on stage or, or sit back um, and lay back and throw information out or actually head up to the stage and there should be, you know, easy accessibility. So is that be something that'd be helpful to plan for? Um, because otherwise you have this communication delay and you waste a lot of time. Um, it's a simple fix, right? If we have stairs, we have easier access to get up on the stage quickly. It's not a lot of money. We could probably, you know, uh, get the stage uh, stairs quickly. So, um, Andy, you wanna add anything about that? You think about that Romeo and Juliet fight on stage. Uh, let's see, you're involved as a lighting designer. Um, what do you have to think about differently, the different techniques and strategies for communication setting that up? Are you talking about like during a fight call? Sure, there's many different situations and I was using that as a hypothetical, but yeah, that, that could be one of them. Um, so it was just a use as a framing tool. The standing speaking. Yeah, well, it is a, a challenge technical process and uh, getting really into the tech of it and the processing of it. Um, I could talk about this uh, you know, on end, <laughs> but without end. It. <laughs> for, um, you know, movement needs and communication with deaf actors and artists on stage or deaf technicians, you know, or just um, general deaf involved in the process in the theater world. Um, yeah, the visual, that, that cue, the sign for hold, teaching everybody that, that's important. And the hearing actors, when you see hold, the other you know actors do it. So everybody, hearing and deaf, is all doing it. It becomes you know kind of a community effort. Um, I think it's really effective that way. And also, it's, it's possible to use lights, like Joy mentioned, um, to have that kind of flashing lights. But that can be a bit of a challenge um, for the stage manager or you know, the person that's already kind of focusing on another job has to also think about how to you know, click to get people's attention with the lights. So there might be a delay. So I really think that the, the best way to, to do that is to separate the system to have a, you know, the, the light board and then also someone else that's doing the flashing lights. Like make that a separate system and not have it be one person in one um, you know, area. So kind of separating into two areas, nice. suggestion. 
I mean, is it complicated to set up something like that? And then he said, no, it's simple. And this is Kyle speaking, that it really does also depend on the space. Are we talking about a big proscenium theater or a smaller place? You could use things like flashlights, really, if, if the room will accommodate that. So you can figure out different problem solving efforts depending on how many people are in the room and how far away right. the audience okay. is from the stage, et cetera. And he said, yeah, I agree. Beautiful. I just want to uh, add something. When the hearing audience, you know, they often don't think of that kind of stuff, have, having those options, uh, having a little light, um, having just a light switch next to the keyboard. I mean, it would be that simple. Um, production managers, it's important to kind of share that information with the hearing group. You know, deaf people are used to lights, right? But the hearing folks, have been in so many different rehearsals, so many different processes, and they've never seen that before. And it might think it's an emergency, might be confused about suddenly a strobe light going off uh, during a rehearsal. So kind of a setting up a new uh, ground rule for how to communicate and, and make sure, I think it's it's the responsibility of who's who's producing the show to make sure everyone's on the same page and, and everyone kind of feels like they're all part of the same group, they're all in, in on it. Um, and they can continue to use that approach, use that technology to improve benefit for everyone, even if there's not deaf involved in the in the show. So um, if there's nothing else, we'll get on to the next question. Joey, did you have a comment? Yes, this is Joey, if I may. Uh, speaking from a deaf actor perspective, let's say I am backstage and I need to know my cue for an entrance. I might have a cue light. That way I don't have to depend on what is being spoken aloud on stage, but rather I can have a cue light and that will signal my entrance. That's what I usually have set up as a deaf actor and it's a fairly huh. uh, normal thing. So, so far in discussion, we've talked about uh, making comments and mentioning the ideas of different approaches, different techniques related to things that we already have. We already have access to these things. It's not new technology we're adding to a theater. We're not creating, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just using what we have and adapting it. So I've not seen anything to be afraid of so far in terms of you know, logistics or budget or anything like that. So um, so you can talk about Romeo and Juliet, Romeo and Juliet again. You're talking about the fight scene or other scenes in the play where it's very dark, when they're in a cave or in the tomb, where it's very dark. Those kinds of scenes are. Um, Paula, Annie, do you have any thoughts about how to run a production? Uh, that process of hitting those light cues when the light is, is a little bit uh, too dark for easy communication. You know, is there a story that's happened to you or a lesson that we can learn from, from your experiences dealing with low light situations? This is Annie speaking. Um, honestly, it's good that sometimes you have a, a, interpreters on stage or in the wings. Um, and so if you need to, to hold uh, or there's a, you know, change with because of the dark whatever you have the interpreter go to, to communicate with the, the person um, to let them know it's kind of uh you also though with like movement and lights and with the flow and everything you can have the interpreter help uh, explain what's happening in that way but it can be a little bit sticky with lighting because you have to try to light the show for the audience at the same time of course right right and then not um bring up all the lights you know you have to keep um, consistency in the in the production and make sure everything looks good. So um, another solution could be yeah you know, bringing up the lights and then doing the clarifications you need and and then mm -hmm. darken the lights again. But yeah, using the interpreters or doing some uh, lighting adjustments when needed. You mentioned interpreters uh, being in the wings. I mean, looking at like a availability of interpreters, working with hearing people, uh, maybe some of this, the cast or sta stage workers maybe pick up some sign, maybe you could agree to develop some sort of 
process to facilitate communication even without the interpreter available? Is that a dangerous thing or should we always just say, you know what, we need an interpreter here no matter what. Um, I don't want to, you know, break the law. I have to make sure I have an interpreter if I need to, but what, is there flexibility there to work with the stage uh, cast and crew? Paula. Sure, this is Kala speaking, really. It depends on the group and the production. If you're talking about like tech rehearsal, that yeah, I've had experiences before in shows where we had deaf and hearing actors and in the space backstage, it was really dark and you couldn't see anything. We did have cue lights, but, but we, we had to open the doors on stage for people's entrances and, and it sometimes uh, two deaf people would open the door and sometimes a team of one hearing a deaf person would open the door but it's important to be consistent with how you assign those backstage tasks so you um are you know what cues you are responsible for and what cues you are assigned to. I just want to clarify. Thank you, Carla. Um, and I'll get to you Annie, in a second. So you're talking about in your experience, you can possibly assign a cue to another actor, actually, to communicate with a deaf actor. Is that right, Carla? Correct, yes. OK, great. Uh, Annie, go ahead. Yeah, this is Annie speaking. I want to go back to what uh, Kala said. Um, and you can ask too what the deaf actors are willing to do. Maybe the deaf actors are comfortable working with a peer, another hearing actor to help um, during the tech element, or maybe they have an interpreter that they'd prefer to work with. Every deaf person has their own preference. Okay. So you just have to ask them really, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's move on to another question. If you could uh, give a few examples of common mistakes that a well-intentioned hearing folks make um, related to communication. Uh, Annie, you had mentioned you'd worked on uh, a lighting board during a tech rehearsal, the communication strategies, I mean, you know, what, what things have gone wrong and, and, and how have you been able to resolve this? So the tech process you mean, speaking about that part of it? Sure, let's focus on that. Okay. I'll try to keep it uh, concise here. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, you can, you can, you know, let it all out, go for it. Okay. I've been in this business, yeah, a long time and I'm still figuring things out, you know? Um, but, you know, trying to find the right solution for, for issues, you know, with, in terms of lighting design and the production process um, is very focused on sound, but of course, um, it's hearing based. There are, you know, headsets people use and, uh, sure, sure. and then lighting designers, you know, of course, use headsets for communication. Um, and then they have the the programmer you know there and then the stage manager that like the headsets are used to communicate with all these people back you know behind the scenes kind of um there's so many different so much different communication all happening through headsets so it's a big challenge for me obviously that aspect so the best solution uh, yeah. so far that i've come up with has been you know having to speak for myself with the headset um and then i have an interpreter on a headset too. And the interpreter will be there with me um, and kind of um, in my sight line mm -hmm. so that I can, uh, that we can communicate together. The interpreter's listening in the headset and telling me what, what's, what's happening and I'm speaking for myself at the same time as I'm on the job. And then I have the other, uh, you know, the other people, the team all, all involved. And that's, been the most effective. I've tried testing, you know, voice recognition software and different kinds of solutions, tech solutions. Um, voice recognition software is a little bit difficult because the microphone still picks up a lot of other sounds in the room. Mm -hmm. So it's not like 100% uh, reliable. So 
I mean, I'm I'm open to you know the world of you know every, other people have different ideas, but uh, really the more deaf people become designers, the more deaf people are, that you can involve in this field and different kinds of field within the theater world. Uh, maybe you know it'll change, but the right now it's it's really yeah. focused on the uh, auditory aspect. Colin. Yep, I would just like to add that as a stage. Manager, I face the same issues with headsets, of course. And he said, yes, of course, obviously. So what kind of frustrations and solutions have you been able to come up with uh, as a stage manager? Well again, it really, well, again, it really depends on the space. Sometimes I will sit with an interpreter at the tech table or in the booth, and I can use them for visual cues. We'll tap on each other's shoulders, that kind of thing. Uh, we've 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 used like um, iPad communication with like FaceTime or whatever, but that tends to have technical delays. That also might depend on the Wi-Fi that's that's in the space. We we face those kinds of technical challenges. Um, I've also worked as as backstage crew when I could hear better and I could. I, I couldn't understand what they were saying on the headset, but I could hear that they were saying something. <laughs> and that was a challenge as well. That's good to know, Annie. I wanna add one thing um, as a lighting designer and in the tech side, in the DC area, I worked with a lot of um, electricians and different- um, Spot operators. Spot operators, thank you. And uh, it was a challenge with the, with the headsets, but they could hear something was happening, right? Um, and that was their cue to do um, what, their, what they next had to do. So it was like, I, oh, I, the deaf uh, artist would be like, oh, I heard something, so I'll go, you know. Um, so that, that, that worked um, for them, that, that person I worked with there. But it was still a still challenge that we all uh, continue to face. Interesting, Joey. Yes, this is Joey. I'll add, um, I'm very good friends with uh, the follow spot operator of whom you speak about. Uh, she is an extremely assertive professional person and is always willing to be proactive about uh, problem solving. So for example, if uh, she hears something happening, she might look to another follow spot operator to clarify what's going on. Uh, I know that she also usually has a uh, laptop set up with a live chat box happening while she is running follow spot. One thing that ought to be understood is that deaf people are excellent expert hackers. <laughs> if any problem, any issue comes up, we know how to solve it we have a better approach and a better solution to whatever is in front of us. Hearing people may not know how to solve the solution for communication with uh, deaf professional coworkers, but if you ask them, they will have a solution for you. Just as Kala mentioned and Annie mentioned, it's very simple. You just ask. Great. So, I think we should ask, sometimes hearing people um, become very creative. Um, we focus on creativity and we get this technology, we set it all up and we hook everything up and get all the wiring going and we're really excited about that and we feel like we've done a great job and we wanna give you a surprise. You know, here's some technology to help you. Um, is that good or dangerous? To, you know, what is your experience with uh, hearing production and stage managers kind of taking the initiative, not asking, but just going it for it and setting something up on your behalf. Have you experienced with that? Is Andy speaking? I mean, I think it's it's great that, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, again, it's it's important to have a collaborative team. And if, if, if a, you know, hearing team wants to uh, surprise us with something, we need to communicate, you know, beforehand. But right, uh, right. they have an idea, they, they could say, you know, what do you think? These are our ideas. Um, just don't, you know, s s have them offering like, here's a solution done. It's, it's important that the hearing uh, team collaborates with us and they collaborate right. together. Kala. Yep, I just wanted to uh, add that, yes, I definitely agree with that. Sometimes uh, lots of hearing people think they have the solution and they buy equipment that they think is the 
solution. And then we realize, oh, we just wasted all that money because it doesn't work. Joey? And this is Joey, just to tack on something else. No deaf person is the same. And perhaps you've worked with a deaf artist or a technician or a designer before, and you are accustomed to working with them, but the solutions for that person may not uh, accommodate the next deaf person that you run into, and they may mm. have different needs or preferences. Great to know. So it seems, I mean, it's a good idea to be involved with that and keep deaf people in your production. Um, that's obvious, it's a, a, of benefit. And have people at different levels of, of um, we have deaf people want to be uh, involved. We want hearing people to be excited and assertive about uh, yeah, you have communicating and accommodating. And I think it would be a wonderful theater company who could you know, bring interpreters for everything. I mean, that would be, and think that they've solved all the communication problems by, you know, <laughs> is that right? Is that how they do it? Just fill the, fill the place with interpreters and call it a day or, um, so related to the issue of interpreters, what, what, what have you learned uh, with hiring interpreters, bringing interpreters into the theater for rehearsals or during the production process? Uh, is that a fix? Do they just hire any interpreter, like bring an interpreter in, call it a day? Annie, what do you, what do you have speaking. to say? Yeah, and you probably saw my expressions when, I, when you talked about uh, interpreters and maybe uh, call it too. But um, it's a situation that we're still figuring out. There's no right or wrong answer to the, the question, really. Um, and I don't know where to start. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we'll start with okay. They bring an interpreter in. Okay. You know, it's a great benefit to have an interpreter. But what does that look like for you? Or how does that, you know, if they haven't checked with you, or or does it? Do they need to make sure they're checking with you? Obviously, we'd prefer to have an interpreter who has knowledge of the theater and experience in that world. And just to know at least, you know, basic theater terms like upstage and downstage, stage right, stage left, like even that kind of terminology. Um, those kind of terms are really important for us. And so we need to have interpreters that, that are aware of them. And then also, um, when you think about working with an interpreter, you know, it can really delay the communication process even more so if they don't understand the uh, terminology and it can be a lot of confusion. And in terms of light, lighting design, that's kind of twofold because there's specific, uh, you know, there's vocabulary to the lighting design world that's very specific and technical and in depth and, you know, you need to have a knowledge of that too. There's a specific group of interpreters that I work with because they know my vocabulary both theater terminology and then the lighting design terminology. Okay. And so I do prefer interpreters um, that, that uh, you know, have that. So I do tell um, theater companies, these interpreters I rec would, would um, prefer to work with. And it just helps the communication process be a little smoother. Um, and I could talk a lot more about that, but I'll <laughs> let someone else take a turn. So yeah, let me see if I can get a little more information about that. So um, can an interpreter just, you know, Google theater terms and look them up and they'll be ready or they got it and they're good to go. And then you think they'd be ready to get out in the theater world and apply all those terms really easily or what, what, what often happens? What are the mistakes that happens? When, uh, what's the lingo? What are the linguistic challenges of working in theater? What, what lingo would they struggle with, you think? And he said, see, Joey's Joey. ready to take over here. Well, have at it, Joey. <laughs> OK, this is Joey. OK, some interpreters can pick up on the lingo fairly quickly. Google is a tool. But uh, you have to understand that as a deaf artist, the deaf artist is already very adept at their work and in the process of working in a the theater and they know all of the vocabulary. So it's quite a strain to wait for an interpreter to catch up and pick up on what's being talked about. If you have an interpreter that is ready to go, knows what's happening, then everyone can work in tandem and specifically the interpreter and the deaf artist. It makes the process so much easier. Okay. Um, I 
I know that uh, many of us deaf artists are very understanding of the context of where we're working geographically, regionally. There are various ways to get interpreters through agencies or otherwise. I once worked on a show where the theater company had already signed a contract with an interpreter, uh, or rather two interpreters. They provided two interpreters, which was great. I arrived at the theater and I realized that both of the interpreters that were provided were not were not great. It's n it's not necessarily that they didn't have enough experience. Each of them had 30 years of interpreting experience. It just wasn't the best quality for the context. And I've met some interpreters like that. Uh, it's a fair, it's not an uncommon problem, especially in the industry. But the biggest issue uh, with this situation specifically was that the theater company had already signed this contract ahead of time. Oh, okay. So when I went to uh, file a formal grievance through my chain, I found out that they were bound to this contract. The theater company was stuck in a difficult situation. Okay. So. So let me ask about contracts and terms of the contracts and, and negotiating those contracts. We were talking about with interpreters just a moment ago, but the cultural uh, culture of expectations, uh, be, you know, usually we want to swap out and make changes, but theaters and interpreters that field. Um, you know, you think about the different core fields of interpreting, there's um, medical and legal and different uh, other types of things ethically um, that we have to look for, but it can cause problems for you in the theater world as, in the, as a deaf artist dealing with interpreters. Um, a good example would be, uh, Joey's talking about having that contract. It's not, nothing against contracts, but it should have something included in the contract talking about that, uh, you know, how well you can communicate and access, uh, have access through that interpreter. This is Joey. Transparency is important. You want to make sure that when you are arranging for accessibility and accommodations to work with your deaf artists, make sure to check with the client first, with the deaf artist in the room. Do that before you put anything on paper, okay, before you okay. sign anything, just from the beginning of the process. You can have all sorts of discussions and negotiations with um, an interpreting agency, for example, but always make sure to go back and check with the deaf artist and have a conversation about, hey, we're providing two interpreters. Here are the interpreters' names. Here is a little bit about their experience. Would you like to meet the interpreters ahead of time over um, a Skype call, let's say? And if all of that is agreeable, then go ahead and have a contract with either a direct hire interpreter or with an agency. Great, beautiful. Oh, uh, Annie. This is Annie speaking. For me, my process is a little bit different. I mean, basically, um, I tell theater companies what I need. I make suggestions um, and, and give them a, a list. You know, for example, my next show will be at Milwaukee, Milwaukee. Repertory Theater. Um, that will be next March, opening, uh, open in March. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. But they're very uh, exciting, so I'm really excited and looking forward to that project. Um, and then, you know, communicating with them and, but every situation is different. Um, uh, they were able to provide one of my uh, preferred interpreters with a local interpreter. So I'm able to um, have one that I prefer and then another one that's um, from the community. And I have a, Great. Um, you know, they are willing to provide that access um, at the same time, um, giving good quality and assurance that the quality will be, will be good. And it'll be high because, um, you know, there's only a limited number. It's like three interpreters that really know the lighting design terminology. So, but again, there's a lot of different ways to do it and a lot of different options. Carla. Yep, I would just like to add the same thing. Uh, it's easy for, 
me to just to provide the list of interpreters that I know are good. But if it's a place that I haven't worked before, that might be a bit of a stickier problem. Uh, but it's really important to network within the community to make the process more efficient. Make sure that the interpreter knows uh, theater vocabulary or the vocabulary that's specific to the to the department within theater. Uh, you know, you start with the first the first uh, area of basic theater term terminology and then specialize to each department. I mean, it's a lot of work. I think uh, responsibility falls on the on the uh, the deaf folks who are, who are working in this field. So what what can the production side the uh, what kind of things what kind of stacks that that they can help kind of level the 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 workload because you guys are taking on so much in recommendation and, and doing all this stuff but what can they do annie this is annie speaking yeah i can provide the uh, like production side of it that perspective um you know the i know i know from my perspective that, it, that budgeting is also a big issue for interpreting um and honestly like hiring uh it includes hiring a lot more people um when you're working with deaf uh, artists you have to bring in bring in extra people that's what that means so you know the first step is, is about time with your when you're um you know working with deaf artists you have to really work on the timeline in terms of starting way far in advance to start your planning and do it and do your research, you know, find solutions and, and talk with your, um, your contractors, um, start write some grants, start doing budget right. planning and everything uh, far in advance. And don't be afraid to, yeah, ask your deaf artists, um, you know, or ask donors and ask for, for funding and um, maybe include them, your deaf artists in the marketing as well, um, and say, okay. no, we're really happy to spotlight our deaf talent and um, we want uh, them to work with us, but we want your help to uh, um, allow them to be able to work with us, you know, and, um, and really start that process far in advance. That's why I say it in includes time. Uh, but Joey also mentioned um, um, locations, you know, like areas, different communities and cities. Um, some have more accommodation and access than others, depending on your region um, and, and the size of the city, things like that. And that can be a challenge to think about as well in terms of local interpreters, if you, where your theater is. So it's, it's gonna be mindful that when you're talking about local interpreting agencies um, and access, you know, maybe some communities really have no idea what uh, the needs are for, for deaf artists. And then, you know, having to work with, um, with the community and try to, you know, work with the agency. Sometimes, um, you know, agencies want to charge an arm and a leg and the companies don't know, um, or theater companies don't realize that what's, what that system is like. Um, very yeah. cut and dry. It's and some other places are really cut and dry, but oftentimes there's negotiations that are going to be involved. Uh, but you can you can ask other other people their opinions. You can ask um, you know ask around um, and ask in your town in your community to get other um, quotes and other ideas. Joey. Yeah, this is Joey. When you're talking about how a theater company might be able to take some of the burden off of a deaf artist, one of the best solutions for me is to have a deaf person in the administrative branch of the company. Uh, for me as an actor, if I know that a theater company has already hired a director of artistic sign language, DASL or Dazzle. I know that we are already in good shape because the Dazzle is there uh, to help work out those kinks in terms of 
how to set up the rehearsal room and the process and the accommodations. That is their role. Kala knows from working at a Mosaic Theater Company as the access coordinator, is that right? So she was responsible to make sure that there was accessibility provided for deaf audiences. Oh. Um, yes, just wanted to add on to that note that it would be great if we had a deaf person at that admin level. But if you don't, you can hire a consultant or as Joey said, a dazzle. I worked for Dog and Pony Theater in DC that had both. And it would be good if they would be able, they could try to help the hearing staff be more aware of deaf accessibility issues, of deaf culture. And that sort of spread, spreads throughout the whole theater company so that in general, people are more aware. Right, right. I know that uh, we here, and uh, this audience, this group here online, um, and we want to hear from those people related to uh, the HowlRound. And they have many, many names, a long list of names and pictures, uh, full webinars of, of these folks, of uh, Dazzles, um, who, so th there's a list of folks who do this kind of work. You might have to find, you know, which theater company already has experience working with uh, deaf artists. And those theater companies, you know, have already learned and changed and adapted, um, so they could share uh, their experiences as well. So from Annie, Joey, and Kala, I've noticed from your comments that you're not recommending, you know, that they call an agency to provide an interpreter um, to for counseling and advice about providing equal access. You're not. Often hearing theater companies think that uh, an ASL interpreter is a certified person who can, you know, has a little experience with interpreting, who knows, uh, will take care of my show. My Romeo and Juliet show will be perfect. They'll take care of A to Z, that interpreter, they will cover everything. Is that a dangerous thought to think the interpreter is just going to uh, cover everything? Because I think theater, hearing, think, hearing theater companies think, oh, well, I have a hearing interpreter. Is that good enough? Um, is that a disappointment or frustration? Is that a problem? P please be honest. We're, we want to get this <laughs> clarified. This is Joey. I'll say something. It's a tricky situation. Uh, an interpreter is also an advocate for us as deaf artists. It's nice to have people who are supportive of the idea of including deaf artists in the process. There is a fine line between advocacy and taking away the agency of someone else, of disempowering them. And uh, sort of replacing them as an advocate who speaks for the oppressed. So there's a fine line in the advocacy. I will say again, every deaf community is different. For example, in the DC region, the deaf community is very strong. There is Gallaudet University right here in the city. And there is a plethora of deaf people in leadership in various fields all over this region. There are some other states where the deaf community may be large, but people are not in leadership, the advocacy is a little weaker and, and lacking. And so oftentimes you will run into those hearing advocates even mm -hmm. more in those regions. I highly suggest that a theater company invites the deaf person to the table and allows them to speak for themselves.
If you have a hearing advocate in the room and you notice that they're starting to speak for the deaf people, just be mindful that can be a tricky situation. And make sure that they are also uh, creating power and space for the deaf artist. Okay, yeah, and related to power, we're talking about money. It's, it's I think, equal to power often. Um, you've talked about having deaf artists, deaf designers, and folks in the tech side of things. Um, that whole group of people who kind of follow you, you have the interpreters and all, all these folks who are supporting. Um, the budget and talking about, you know, talking about ahead of time, you know, people hire deaf people, they're concerned about the budget issues. So wh what can you share about this, the money related to access? The, what's the financial, um, is it really terrible? Is it something that, is, is there a lot of sticker shock related to that? What, what would you say about that? This is Annie, I wanna go back a little bit to that previous statement about what I said, when I talked about time, you know, sure. and that is related to, to funds, but I wanna be clear, you know, interpreting agencies have a specific way of working. Sure. So sometimes they're, um, that their actions and then the, the theater's funding doesn't always fit. And to be honest, um, when I was uh, uh, right out of grad school, I was all excited. I'm a professional designer, I was ready to go. Um, and I got a uh, general manager emailed me and said, um, I have to pay the interpreters more than you? Like they were, they were shocked. And that was my first experience really hit me. I said, what? The interpreter's getting paid more than me? Wow, okay. Wow. And that was like 10, 11, 12 years ago or something. Um, and to navigate through that experience, you know, going back to um, my preferred, you know, method, I, I will suggest um, and put out suggestions with uh, working with individuals rather than agencies. That's one thing I do uh, recommend, working directly with interpreters rather than going through Mm -hmm. agencies. But every deaf person, of course, is, is different. And I have my own solution that I would offer. Yeah. Um, and, and Joey has his, Paula uh, has theirs. So everybody, everybody is, is different. But I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so I guess, oh, <laughs> go ahead. So Joey, did you want to give your take uh, about that budgeting and interpreting and how, how to manage and juggle that? This is Joey. Interpreters are expensive. Full stop. It should be understood that the interpreting business model, like Annie mentioned, is very different from a theater's business model. If you are uh, taking the salaries of designers and actors, et cetera, um, and you break it down to look at the rates of those theater professionals versus interpreters, um, the rates of interpreters trump those in the theater realm, unfortunately. This is a well-known and wide problem. Um, okay. Um, to try and negotiate with an agency, with a, with a company, can be very difficult to do because an agency has their model set. If you're going to ask to provide interpreters at a lesser rate, it's not going to happen. Sometimes it may be better for, an, for a theater company to have a negotiation with a direct hire interpreter. And if you're working with an individual professional, they may be willing to negotiate a discounted rate. But I will say the practice of getting interpreters onboarded and assigning them, if you have two interpreters that you've gotten for everyday use during um, a rehearsal or a tech process, and one of them is sick or injured, then the theater company needs to find a, a substitute or replacement for the interpreter that can't make it to that day. And that substitute interpreter is going to charge a higher fee, a premium for a last minute job. 
It's important to secure your interpreters at least two weeks in advance uh, for all of the dates. The madness of finding interpreters and assigning them to different tasks uh, is, is, is just that madness. The agencies, that is what they do, that is they have their own schedulers and take care of that madness. So you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about it if you just wanted to keep paying them to take care of the scheduling. So, yes. But as I mentioned, deaf people are expert hackers. Annie had a brilliant solution to uh, her issues. She was able to navigate and be the captain of her own ship on the sea in terms of accommodation, the sea of accommodation. And she was <laughs> on that ship knowing where to go. Awesome. So talk a little bit more about your experience working with um, other uh, hearing members of the production group. Uh, if they're able to sign, how does that help your process? If they're uh, capable of signing, uh, those hearing folks are kind of motivated to, to learn sign and, and communicate directly. And he's speaking now. Uh, we have, there are two assistant lighting designers um, that work with me. They work with me, and they um, they don't sign, you know, fluently. No, they they finger spell. They're both hearing. And they're they hearing, okay. Spell, and they sign just a little bit. They're kind of beginning signers. But I have been in situations where theater companies, you know, they say, "Oh, do you want to have an assistant like interpreter too?" And um, you know, it's it's different. My my job, um, I need to focus on my my job and have a, an assistant that's helping me with my job, not like assistant who's, you know, interpreter. You know, I want those things to be separate and I have to make that clear distinction. Okay, not kind of uh, doing a slash role of two things at the same time. You want your assistant to be your assistant, your interpreter to be the interpreter, got it. But I could have, you know, two assistants because maybe uh, if they're not incredibly fluent signers, um, they could, uh, you know, information I may be missing or um, we can try to recognize what's what's happening in terms of our communication in the room and then also um, maybe they could catch things that my interpreter missed because I have extra kind of uh, yeah assistant they use their little you know bit of sign to try to um, tell me communicate things with me privately um, and so I have those um, two people with me uh, because you know we have a relationship now we've developed that and I'm sure uh, maybe Kala has had similar different situations as well, but um, of like peers in the business that uh, sign a little bit. So I know that sometimes uh, hearing assistants or lighting designers, uh, assistants, uh, people in the productions, um, they'll find that, oh, I can sign or I can pick it up. And it's, you know, during the, the production, they start to learn. And by the end, they're a little bit better, but why not take the time to, to learn ahead of time? <clears throat> and so how can we represent ourselves better? So often directors will overlook, you know, we put in there that we have, in my resume, I have experience working with deaf actors. Uh, often they don't recognize that or don't uh, uh, notice that. So when a theater company is looking for uh, an interpreter said, oh, that person is uh, a stage manager who has a signing background. Well, we'll just bring them in. That's, is that a, you know, they can pay them uh, instead of paying interpreters so they can, you know, save money by keeping it in uh, in th the theater. And so it's kind of a <laughs> off two, two boxes at once. You know, I hired one deaf artist why not hire two or three or four or five? Um, you know, mess, they're less reliant on that third interpreter to run around. So if everyone is, is you're creating a signed space, everyone can sign like the stage manager is deaf. Then we, we have deaf artists working with a manager who's deaf and you don't need an interpreter for that interaction. So, you know, if theaters in the Boston area are becoming very creative in how to offer value uh, 
you know, you use get the most out of the interpreters. Um, so sometimes not getting the full worth out of it. Um, you know, interpreters traveling back and forth to rehearsal. Um, you know, the wave parking fees for them might be helpful. Um, sometimes interpreters. You know, Annie calls an interpreter from a different area to come. Um, can a theater company make you know a bed available so that they can stay instead of having to commute, and it will save some money. Uh, maybe including food in the budget. You know, um, you know, instead of having food for ten people, we're gonna have food for 10, twelve people. Uh, so it kind of offer a deal for the interpreter. So reduce some of those extra costs interpreters have to come up to cover and and you can negotiate something to make it more affordable to have interpreters so i want to thank joey and annie and Kala for kind of opening my, our minds about what what options we have to be able to do that Ooh, time is flying we're really rich content here so this is great um go back to that fear and turning that into a, a positive affirming and, and, and uh, a healthier <laughs> experience. So I know I'm really thinking about that fight call for Romeo and Juliet. I keep coming back to that, but um, hearing people think about that liability issue, insurance uh, during a fight call, uh, you know, if a deaf person is on stage when you have uh, sharp objects being flung around, how do we address uh, hearing folks concerned about, you know, what strategies can we do or not necessarily, but how do we address the concerns uh, that hearing people have about the liability of having deaf people on set? Um, you know, feel like oh, I don't want to deal with the concern about liability and maybe they don't want to hire deaf people for that reason. How, how do you address that? Joey? This is Joey. I think that fight choreography with deaf people is doable. Absolutely. You can do it. A fight choreographer who says, oh, well, uh, we need to have auditory cues and that's the only way to do it. They're lying. It's <laughs> okay. I believe that most production managers are aware um, and fight choreography as well, that, it, that it's a slower process because the number one priority is safety. Fight choreographers, right. they already know, they have their steps in their queuing system of one, two, three, four. Okay, let's go back and do that again. One, two, three, four. When you're working with deaf artists, uh, deaf artists already have an innate ability of um, visual acuity as well as muscle memory, and they will be able to pick up on that and develop their own communication with a choreographer who's communicating like that. And in some cases, the deaf actors are better at the hearing actors and picking up on those visual and physical cues. Sure, yeah. I can predict that stuff that's coming. So, uh, Annie. Yes, um, this is Annie speaking. Related to safety, um, Joey was talking about there were hackers. Uh, you know, deaf people were hackers, <laughs> and we're very aware of our surroundings as deaf individuals. So um, when I'm, you know, working with uh, focus um, and uh, and whatever's happening, you know, if we're if it's in the dark, for example, and um, we have to develop a system with my electricians uh, in terms of. Um, we don't really need to communicate when we're fixing the lights necessarily. Um, it's less of a need for an, an interpreter because you're, you know, it's it's less um, um, less bodies on stage and, and it um, makes it more safe. Sure. So so we all, you know, figure it out in terms of uh, solutions um, to match our needs. Really. That's great. Um, we could talk about. The rehearsal process now, for example, uh, read throughs, uh, table reads. Uh, what techniques or ideas do you use during table reads or table work or reading th read throughs uh, in some of your rehearsal experience, other productions you've been in? Any thoughts you have? 
you know, table reads or even um, production meetings, design meetings, those kind of things. Joey? Do you mind repeating the question? Um, talking about like, how do you, how do you manage that space in, in table reads, rehearsals, that early stuff where you're, you're really just doing design meetings? Joey, go, go ahead. Okay, in the rehearsals, uh, not so much. During tech, uh, there's two things that seem to be common. Having a cue light of some kind, as well as a video screen or a monitor so you can see what's happening on stage. Sure. I think in maybe one or two cases in my personal memory, there was actually a, a TV monitor on stage, um, if I can explain, uh, that was a, in the house above the audience. So for example, I as a deaf actor, if I'm downstage, I can look at the monitor to see what's happening behind me upstage. Oh, wow. I know I have some personal experience working with some of you and uh, sometimes we'll have you know, the, the playwright right there in the room. Sometimes we'll be changing lines while you're doing the read through and, and going over it. So how do we make sure the deaf artists are aware of the line replacements and the changes that are being made uh, while we're doing these table reads? Any thoughts about that? Have you ever experiences with that? Joey, go ahead. Yes, I know what you're talking about. Uh, sometimes, in some cases, a playwright, or let's say we're all sitting around doing table work, and we might have a read through, um, and the playwright wants to change, uh, or we're going through notes, and a playwright wants to change one word and one particular sentence on page, it's whatever. It's difficult for a deaf artist to take those notes as well as mark them in their script because visually they're looking up at the person giving the notes and back down at their script. And it can get confusing very quickly. In my case, we developed a really simple solution, which was that we projected a version of the script oh. in the room. So if there was a line change, they say, okay, everyone look at the projection to see the line change. We look at that, we write it down in our script, problem wow. solved. That's super easy. Just have a laptop and a projector. That's it. Annie. This is Annie speaking. For me, with the design process and the you know, creative team, when we get together to discuss um, and come up with ideas way before the rehearsals start, um, it can be a challenge sometimes because you know maybe um, we have designers or directors or different people um, you know, working together, the creative team, um, and trying to uh, communicate all together um, in different places. It can, be, it can be overwhelming and emails, you know, hard, hard to read through all of the different thoughts and, and emails can be, yeah, sometimes it, this can be a challenge, this part, part of the process. And then um, sometimes there's not funding to help resolve the issues we need resolved. And sometimes we'll have to use a video relay service, VRS, you know, for in, interpreting for during the like phone calls. Um, and that's actually, you know, the video relay service is actually a- um, Can you say that one more time? It's, it's free from the government, but it's no cost. It's automatically uh, provided. <laughs> Can you explain VRS one more time? Cause I think yes. uh, all the hearing people just jumped out of their chairs. You said something <laughs> was free. It's called VRS, it's video relay service. BRS abbreviation. And it's a service that's provided where there are interpreters that have headsets and they, you know, interpret um, and uh, between hearing and, and deaf folks. And, um, you know, they have like calling centers. Um, and it could be whatever, you know, if, if you're calling someone's like principal or you're calling social security or whatever, it's just everyday life, uh, you know, whatever or phone call you make. You when know? I have to call my mother. Um, so, and you talked about like this being sponsored by Sorensen. That's one of the um, people that are supporting this. That's a VRS company. And so if I need to have a design conversation, um, you know, I have to give the interpreter kind of a heads up. If I'm using VRS, I'll say, hey, we're gonna be talking about, um, 
you know, there'll be different, three or four different people calling in. If I'm talking about a creative team meeting, I'll give them a heads up the interpreter and say, hey, we're talking about this play. I'm the lighting designer. Um, you might hear this word, um, you know, it's gonna be okay if you don't know this terminology, like, you know, kind of having that conversation with the VRS interpreter ahead of time. Yeah, um, and then also warning my, you know, creative team as well and say, hey, just so you know, this is going to be happening through an interpreter, this call, um, and I let them know what, what it'll be like. Great. But it does, it, it does, it does work though. It's beautiful. And then another, well, a couple other, um, you know, free solutions would be uh, video, like uh, using Zoom, this system, or Skype. Like, like what we're doing like now. What we're using sure. now, yeah. Um, or FaceTime, you know, to do to do a video uh, call. There's also messaging apps, different programs and, and apps where you can do different uh, chats. Like there's also this sort of Slack, if you're familiar with it, where you can message uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. group messaging, but it does require some, well, openness and willingness from the other members of the creative team to make it happen. Sure. As much as uh, you know, you want to be involved in the process. I love when people really want to collaborate and, and work together um, um, and coordinate together. But it's tough to have people working on a scene from all over uh, ge geographically. So you have to be kind of creative with your solutions, um, because of course, face to face is always best. But sometimes that can happen. Of course. I was just checking my time. Kali, you had something. <laughs> yeah. Hi, this is Kala. I just wanted to add to what Annie said. One good way to reduce the amount of emails, if you're working on like a script together, uh, do it in a Google doc where everybody can share one document instead of trying to send 60,000 emails. Um, and in terms of production meetings, there's, uh, there's, there's a, there's a thing that can happen where everybody's talking over each other, and then with interpreters you have to identify who's talking. So it's good to have that kind of structure in a production meeting so that people are talking at the same time. I mean that they're talking at separate times and that they that they identify themselves before they communicate. Right, right. As an interpreter myself, I thank you for that comment <laughs> and I love you for that because often, uh, well, first. Really, the simple answer is when we listen to this presentation, we can see this, right? We see how this model works. We're all taking turns. It allows actually a much simpler, smoother, clearer communication and conversation uh, instead of this kind of popcorn where everything is happening over one, of, over one another. And later you can kind of figure out that. Um, we had a mistake or a misunderstanding because folks were talking, you know, we've, we've missed something on the budget or something got messed up back when we were all talking over one another. The communication for hearing people, it's actually uh, something that they do often and it creates a lot of mistakes. So it's a, a, quite a benefit um, to ha have this turn taking. Annie mentioned using VRS as a benefit. Um, you can have an interpreter in person or online through this VRS process. Um, but they might not be skilled with the, uh, the, the theater vernacular. So um, it's not that they're not professional, but it's a very intimate thing to have. Sometimes we, uh, hearing and deaf both, make uh, kind of have our own slang, our own code, our own words that we use in our production. You know, R O J Y. What's road J? We don't know what that means. Well, I'm talking about Romeo and Juliet, and you know, Romeo and Juliet. We have to say Ro and J. Like I don't know what you're talking about. But if we had the context, you know, the actors would know. The actors in the show know Romeo, and so we often. Let's say the, the show is Row and Jay or Row, and people get so confused if you bring an interpreter in from the outside through video relay or other things. So it's important to uh, uh, include that in like a Google Doc or something, so that when we're you know using these kind of code words or abbreviations or acronyms or uh, highly contextualized vocabulary, 
um, make it sound a little more like English so that, so that folks from the outside can understand it and it'd be beneficial for your interpreters. So if you, if you could talk about what your best working experience is with a uh, hearing director, uh, what has been the, the best experience that you had? Can you remember a, a great collaboration that you've had in the past? Annie? Annie. Honestly, 80% of my work has been with hearing theater companies. And those shows um, are sure. weren't really deaf related. related. But going back to, you know, um, wanting, to you know wanting to tell a story, that's the point. We're, we're telling a story on the stage. That's my, uh, that's something I'm, I'm passionate about. I, I care about. I want to make sure the story is, is told. And um, one of my favorite memories uh, was doing this show called Into the Breaches. And it was at Alabama Shakespeare Festival this last year. Oh, nice. And it was oh, a wonderful production, just an amazing company all around. And we were in the process in tech and something happened. Um, there was a moment we were kind of stuck on in the show. They were having a, an issue with an actor was supposed to uh, exit in anger, you know, and the door was supposed to slam and it was supposed to be an uh, like audible sound. We heard the door uh, slam and the sound designer um, had the cue for the door, you know, but it didn't sound right. They were, they were struggling with it and they were like, oh, this doesn't feel right. It was just a lot of deliberation about this. And it was like 10, 15, I don't know, 20 minutes. We were just sitting here really going into this discussion and I uh, threw out an idea. I asked, what about a Foley door? A Foley, you know, it has a sound, um, it's a sound thing, you know, specific kind of door. Yeah, yeah one of those little and ones with the handle on it, right? All of them looked at me and they said, oh my gosh, what a great idea. <laughs> the um, deaf person comes up with the best idea for a sound cue. <laughs> That's great. Exactly, exactly. And they, we had, they had a Foley door. Um, they had, you know, they saved, uh, that they brought in and they tested it and it worked perfectly when they did the slam and everybody was all excited and it just I love that happened that a dev you know artist in the room I offered a suggestion for a sound issue <laughs> that I helped them that's solve great that. beautiful you know, I love that because some hearing people you know kind of in that process I don't have experience working with deaf people I think there's a lot of assumptions that get made. They always, oh, I don't want to offend the deaf person. I don't want to involve them in this discussion because it's about sound. So, um, you know, it's sound technical meaning. So I, I just want to invite the deaf person. But I think, yeah, it's probably better to ask, hey, are you interested in coming to this meeting about sound cues? And then let the deaf people decide if they're interested or not. And I personally love, work oh, yeah. Yeah, I go just, ahead. I personally love working with sound designers. I really like that collaboration and that part of the tech process. So, you know, sometimes the two of us, um, we kind of geek out together, you know? <laughs> we try to figure out how the sound and lights will really um, go together really well and how the, the cues are gonna, you know, work. And, and fade out. Cue and lab. Fade outs and fade ins. <laughs> Cue lab. How the exact amount of seconds we have and how we're gonna follow it. I mean, we go in like really in depth discussions about it during that process. So it's a lot of fun. Oh, that's awesome. That's beautiful. Um, Annie and Joey, well, one thing a comp company here in Boston, the Speakeasy uh, stage company. I think every state have a Speakeasy, but the one in Boston, anyway. Um, they love working with you guys. Uh, and I've called you uh, again and again, but they've developed a really interesting process. Um, they've made uh, a Google form with uh, diff different blank fields for interpreters. So what you do is you, you know, put your name, uh, the date of the rehearsal, the date of the show, and everything, all the details are in there. And then the theater can put that out to offer and send that out to interpreters. And you get re responses so quickly and they fill up those 
you know, the deaf people would benefit and the interpreters love it too, because they reply to what they can do instead of, um, you know, you get like a list of requests. Instead of that, you get one request with all the t dates and times in it. And they did make a short video too uh, on YouTube, I believe, with Annie describing who you are and that well, that was put in there. So the interpreters get the email to see what kind of consumer they're working with. Okay, it's a deaf person there. Um, they can kind of make that connection ahead of time. So they know that they can, you know, they feel comfortable, um, helps them know what to negotiate. They know that they have an experienced deaf uh, artist and the interpreters are more uh, well-informed. It's a, a good benefit. So it's a nice thing. This is Annie. Yeah, thank you. It's a thank you. It's a speakeasy. We love them. Yeah, it's it's really it, it's worked to smooth things out. It's been it's been lovely. So, uh, working with uh, deaf professional technicians, uh, you know, like if you're the only deaf person in the room, for example. But if you're working with other deaf people, <coughs> what are the different roles that you have experience uh, in theater. So Joy, yourself, you're your director in a hearing theater company. Um, what, what other roles is it important to have there for deaf people in, in that production? This is Joey. In every production that has a deaf actor, it's greatly beneficial to have a director of artistic sign language or a dazzle. What do they do? Can you explain that a little bit? Well, other states or regions might call them an ASL consultant, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll speak to what a dazzle is. A dazzle helps with the translation of the lines from English going into American sign language. So they oversee and help with the translation of those lines. They work directly with the actor. If the actor is hearing and has to sign, they will also work with that hearing actor. If it's a deaf actor uh, okay. that also has to sign, again, the DAZA will work with that deaf actor on their signing translation. Mm -hmm. And that will help with the integrity of the artistic process and uh, for the performance as well. If the show is set in a specific period, let's say it's a period piece, or let's say it's a very specific regional piece, then the Dazzle, another role or responsibility of theirs is to make sure that the translation matches the period or the geography appropriately in terms of the of the product of the translation. The Dazzle will also help to oversee interpreted performances, working with the interpreting team. If an actor is struggling with their lines, specifically the lines that are signed in ASL, then the Dazzle will may also work one on one with that actor okay. to work on their lines instead of having uh, that go to someone else that's right help critique their work sure and the biggest benefit is that a dazzle can help fill in the need for uh serving a hearing audience oh excuse me i mean a deaf audience for example the dazzle can be the deaf eyes in the room even if they're sitting in the house somewhere, they might physically uh, be the pilot audience and say, hey, in this one moment, in this one scene, the signing is not clear and they'll have a conversation with whomever they need to discuss that with so that uh, fixes are made. So a dazzle in some sense is, is almost serving as a dramaturg and in other cases, almost like a choreographer. Okay, beautiful. That's great. So related to this group, this audience here of, of production uh, directors, 
you have to kind of build time into the rehearsal process um, for the one-on-one -on -one time, fight choreography, kind of building time in for that for the schedule to make sure that we're clear, um, kind of not to expect to just you know, people to get up and sign and everything to be super perfect and everything immediately successful. There's there's some things that need to be done, right? And I think it's also important for the staff to know to use their eye their eye gaze more. Um, hearing stage managers, actors, often we depend on sound, we're not looking. Um, so kind of mentally check out, we're not looking at what's going on. Uh, during your time working with deaf artists, try to be aware of eye gaze. Um, hearing people, you know, get worn out quickly, certainly. Uh, so it's important to use that time to be aware of that um, and give people kind of deaf, deaf people a, time, a mental rest too, because hearing people can check out, well, hearing people, you know, they can talk and, and, and kind of check out, but deaf people have to watch everything that's happening. They have to be on the interpreter the whole time um, and they're, you know, they get exhausted. So it's something to be mindful of and sensitive to. Um, to give uh, deaf folks break after you're going through these long rehearsals. Um, and I mean, I see, I've seen it and you've seen it too, where, you know, deaf folks kind of have to put up with uh, kind of going along with it and, and trying their best to hold on while the interpreter is just going and going and going. And I think that it leads to burnout and exhaustion uh, more quickly. I think we are uh, in the home stretch here, or nearing the finish line. So I want to thank you for uh, putting the time in and, and coming here and being with us. Um, what is your feeling about representation? Talking about, you know, the issues that are obvious here, it seems that Representation, you know, I'm one African American in this field, having this discussion, you know, your identities. I, I'm not sure of all the identities that you, you maintain, but uh, deaf persons of color in this field. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, who you've worked with? Uh, who's inspired you? Who's influenced you? Who've learned from? Do you have any names of folks or stories or th things that you, you have about, you know, other? Folks, Joey. This is Joey. One of my uh, longtime mentors since college uh, is Monique Holt, or Momo oh, for yes. short. Yes, uh, she is a person who's Asian. She's a director and an actor. She's been in this business a very, very long time. She is a pioneer in many different ways. In the deaf community, there is a social hierarchy. And the deaf community also has sexism and racism and other isms on various levels. Speaking to the arts industry, uh, let's say deaf theater specifically, we do face similar situations where the opportunities for people of color are not enough. And also not enough people of color are getting work. This reflects in representation as well. This goes to education. The educational opportunities are not enough. So uh, it's a very similar situation in the deaf community and outside of it. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, things to add, Kala? Kala? Yep, this is Kala speaking. Yeah, I do think that overall similar problems exist, but it seems to be more emphasized backstage and in the admin and design fields that there do seem to be more white 
folks there than there are people of color. That's true. So, yes. Of course, I'm not saying it's completely you know that way. I mean, of course, I have worked with people of color in, in all, all of those areas, but I do seem to think that that area doesn't have much of a presentation. But sure, of course, both sides of the curtain. Yeah. Both sides of the curtain. Yeah. This is Annie. Yeah, I agree. I want to um, recognize other you know people. There's there's um, Michelle. Thanks. Thanks. That's a person of color, a deaf individual. Raising the son at Gallaudet University, worked with her. Uh, and wow, she her list of accomplishments and accolades uh, is incredible. Her experience is just exceptional. Very um, rich history. I just wanted to give her a shout out. Oh yes, she's wonderful. All right, I appreciate that. Um, I think this had a, a great discussion. Is there any thoughts you th things you think we really should get out there? Uh, we haven't really talked about it, stuff we haven't touched on yet. Uh, I'm waiting for your uh, few seconds here to think about that, and if you have something you want to touch on, Annie. This is Annie. Maybe I, you know, I mentioned it a few times during this conversation, but I did want to recognize the need for patience. Something I wanted to highlight. Um, you know, with the communication, um, it you know requires patience, and for me specifically, the tech process. You know, uh, I've been in a situation where there's a lot of pressure on me because um, I'm trying to work fast and I am working fast, um, but the communication part um, is, is sometimes, you know, a slowdown. For example, you know, I have to explain, like my, my interpreter is there and I have to maybe um, talk about it, maybe like, let's say like a new idea, a new look, and I'm trying to explain it. An interpreter is following me and is voicing for me. And then, um, you know, I also have to think and maybe look at the setup and, uh, and continue to think while I'm looking around visually. And then maybe I have to discuss with my assistant and then have to communicate with my programmer. Like there's all these different parts of it before decisions and changes are made. And then I'll maybe ask, you know, that's, that's all part of the process that all those steps of communication and it's, it does require additional time um, than a hearing lighter, lighting designer. So you know, it's it's a natural a natural part of it that just um, requires some some patience, um, and really, um, all for all deaf artists, I think, right? Carla agrees. Anything to add, Joey? Your face. I thought you had something to say. I'm sorry. In terms of Annie's remarks, or to your question? I just. Your last thought, I thought you had something you wanted to get in closing, something we were waiting for that we hadn't touched. Is there something you wanted to say else? Uh, sure, this is Joey. Oh, gosh, I'm trying to keep it short. We can go on a little okay. more. It's fine. Um, looking at the state of theater companies currently, all over the United States. We're having lots of conversations about uh, diversity and inclusion. Oftentimes disability is left out of those conversations. That's disappointing. We have a lot of resources. We have a lot of friends who need work people who are ambitious, willing to roll up their sleeves and get the job done. All that it takes is a point of outreach. That's the first step is to reach out. And if you do the work of reaching out to people and even just asking for ideas and opinions, hey, what do you think about if we do it this way? The work can be mentally and emotionally exhausting and, and, and taxing to do that. And it's the same when a deaf artist is tasked with trying to reach out and offer solutions without ever being asked to do so. Even those that are working backstage. Well, 
we might start to feel that we are the burden in the room. And when I am tasked with creating a story on the stage, I don't also personally want to be thought of as being the burden in the room while I'm trying to do my job. Considering season planning, let's say, you don't have to always find a play that has a character written to be deaf. When you are doing season planning, as you're looking uh, over different options, ask yourself, is it possible to make this character work if we were to hire a deaf actor to do it? And you might be surprised to find that much more depth is being uh, brought to this character. One of my dreams, uh, let's say, if I'm the only deaf person working on a project, or I have a friend who's the only one in, in an entire uh, collaborative process who's deaf. Uh, that might be a, a common experience, but it's always a beautiful thing when more than one of us is in the room work, sure. or in, as part of the process. If you've got an actor and then also and, a technician. And, and why does that say. add value? What, what would you say What makes that better? It certainly adds value. It's, it's valuable because if you only have one deaf person in the room, uh, they are apt to feel like a token. It's a classic tokenism. If you've got two people in a room, maybe you're meeting a quota. When you start to have three people, four people in the room, there's a shift in the dynamics. Yeah. I was once involved in a production where, well, it was not a full production, it was more like a workshop. I believe there were seven different artists involved in the uh, collaborative, creative collaborative process. And that's out of 15 or 16. So, just about half of the people in the room were deaf. And it felt like a family. There was no more being mentally and emotionally tasked with how do I make myself fit in with this structure, but rather everyone felt just naturally on a level playing surface. And it was a wonderful feeling. When I'm sure. the only one in the room, I feel uh, weighted with being representative to an entire community and culture. Yeah, that makes me think about you know, this, this production team, they often plan and organize and get everything settled. You know, get a, you know where to get the haircuts, where to get the hotel, all the resources for the actors, uh, resources for the tech people, the back, the folks backstage, all these different resources. And then a deaf person, a designer, a director, or actor. Um, the resources off on each other, they look on each other. So find that if you you can include that in the invitation saying, you know, the hotel room and the bed. So all those things being available, it's a great thing. It's a hospitality thing, I think. Uh, Annie, what you had said about you know, scheduling for the production process, often people forget that the rehearsal, there's always a post-show meeting, right? A post-production meeting, a post-rehearsal meeting. And that kind of adds a little time, adds an hour or two hours. And Tech Week, you know, it's, I have to remember that scheduling doesn't always follow this Schedule, there's always something at the end, right? Do you have more add on that? Talking about adding more time for those post-production meetings. This is Annie. Yeah, imagine you're working like a, you worked a 12 hour day and at the end you have a post-production meeting. And if you have an interpreter, great. But with, you know, you, but your eyes are already exhausted maybe and your brain is, is tired and wants to stop working. And now you have to try to, if you don't have an interpreter, for example, you have to like lip read everybody in the room. Um, and try to figure out what's all going on. And so it's it's important to be aware of all of the needs in the process. 
and to recognize that it should not just be on the responsibility of the production manager, but the company as a whole to take on the responsibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, working with um, different kinds of uh, artists, not just deaf, but everyone's uh, differences. Um, and we, you know, um, the poor production manager, they, they can feel like completely <laughs> overburdened, but it's really, it should be the whole company working together. Sure. You know, we can talk about the fundraising, the PR folks. Uh, in terms of fundraising, often we say often when well, we fundraising for the show, the season, you know, fundraising for the theater company to provide access too. We could say that. Um, I think a lot of deaf artists would be willing to come and, you know, let people come and watch their process and, and do, you know, a photo shoot and add a little, you know, PR um, thing to help market and, and get better uh, money. You can get grants for things like that. So in the theater world, we all know that some of your cities have bigger small deaf populations or, or bigger small cities. Um, they all, many of the cities have municipal funds for the arts, for the municipal arts council. So they have money saved and ready for ac accessibility. So, so the word access really is a broad term. Um, often that money is not used and it just sits there and gathers dust in an account somewhere. Uh, and if we're not accessing, that's a great opportunity to, to leverage that and adds value to your production process. Um, like people like Joey, Kala, and Annie, and, and many others. Um, you know, the sound designer can't figure out how to make this damn door sound happen. You know, they, they, we have amazing artists available. So, you know, using that budget for that. So there's a, a deaf gain to be had there. So I wanted to thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, HowlRound. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. all the volunteers. Thank you, thank, you, thank you for the interpreters and other people I can't see on this video. And I want to close. Uh, I think we'll have more discussion about this. And HowlRound will have has many other videos and presentations that touches on uh, these issues. Uh, if you go to HowlRound and you search deaf. That's it. Just put deaf in the howround.com website. You'll see many other uh, articles and videos uh, in different theater companies you can contact and you can learn from them how they run their deaf productions. There's so many resources out there too. So um, those who are involved in listening to this presentation, keep asking. Thank you all so much. And Joey, do you want something to say? Yes, this is Joe. Anyone who is on the live stream, watching this live stream, if you have more questions, if you're curious, feel free to reach out to me directly. Or Kala or Annie. And us too. Or yeah. any deaf artist. Many of us deaf artists in the theater world, we know each other. We know others' names. So if you're looking specifically to fill a role for a deaf actor, designer, technician, we know who to refer you to. It's all set. And this is, mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you so much for providing this platform. This is one of my only opportunities to be able to talk about, you know, being a deaf lighting designer. Um, so thank you so much. There's more to thank come. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully things keep warming up a little bit here if it can. <laughs> Love you all. Thank you. And uh, Love to all we'll of you. See you another thank time. You.